It's good to see you all. Joey, the rain yesterday? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Someone's like, I loved it from inside sitting by the fireplace. Maybe you uh, watched one of your favorite Christmas movies yesterday. Did anybody watch a favorite Christmas movie? Okay, on the count of three, say your favorite Christmas movie. One, two, three. Die Hard. Oh, come on. If you don't know Die Hard as a Christmas, you got, no. That probably wouldn't be good if the pastor was like, watch Die Hard. But it is at Christmas time. <laughs> There's uh, Christmas movies like Elf, right? Will Ferrell. Oh man, we watched it last night. I've seen that thing so many times. It makes me laugh and laugh and then kind of feel awkward and laugh. The Polar Express, where there's that really creepy guy on top of the train and no one can explain to me who he really is. Maybe it's one of those edge of your seat, cutting edge, written Hallmark movies where you never really know what's going to happen. I, I'm sorry, Lisa. <laughs> she won't even let me watch them in the same room because she goes, I go, I promise I won't say anything. She goes, but I know what you're thinking and I don't want it in the room with me. <laughs> One of the movies that uh, stands out from years to years to years and if you're younger, you might be like, oh, my grandparents loved that movie. It's a wonderful life. Yeah. Now, some of you might be like, Dale, don't ruin the movie for me. It's been out 75 years. <laughs> I think it's past the statute of limitations of ruining a movie for you. And you're like, oh, I was going to go home this afternoon and watch it. No, you weren't. <laughs> Let me just tell you about it. Obviously, it's a story. If you've seen it or heard anything about it or you check out Wikipedia on the way home, it's a story about a guy who did some amazing things for a lot of amazing people. But because it was assumed that he either stole some money or withheld some money or lost some money, he became overwhelmed, right, with stress and anxiety. And he couldn't come through for people anymore. And this caused him to be uh, emotionally separated from family or from friends and led to a feeling like he was worthless and that actually he probably was worth more dead than alive. And he has this statement where he says, I wish I was never born. Then the movie plays out. And once again, you're like, spoiler alert. Okay, 75 years it's been out. So if you haven't seen it yet, here you go. The movie plays out as if his life was never born. His life was never born. That's a great turn of a phrase there, Dale. <laughs> as if he was never born. And in the struggle of a circumstance that he was going through, the reality is that he under understood the value of his life. He under understood the value of his life and that he truly did have a wonderful life. This idea when we under understand, we are then left with a longing, or it exposes a longing, a gap. From his book, Holy Longing, we read this. The central mystery within all Christianity is the mystery of the incarnation. Unfortunately, it is also the mystery that is most misunderstood or more accurately under understood. It is not so much that we misunderstand what the incarnation means. It is more that we grasp only the smallest tip of the great iceberg. We miss its meaning by not seeing its immensity. Let's pray and ask for God's help today. Father, we ask for your help to understand the incarnation, Jesus, of you coming, taking on flesh, becoming human. It plays well in our nativity scenes. It seems to fit well in Christmas carols. It seems to be a fun celebratory time. 
But God, if we under understand its immensity, help us grasp a little bit more today. Father, I pray for all of us that we can engage for the next few minutes around something that is a mystery that is too big for us to get. Yet with your spirit, we can grasp. In your name, amen. As you read through the Bible or hear through scripture, you will see there are numerous names for God. Dozens and dozens, if not in the 70s and even potentially more. Names like Elohim, which is mentioned at creation. Words like Yahweh or Adonai. In fact, there's literally dozens, like I said. But one of the names that we use a lot and we just uh, probably will sing about it is this idea of the word Emmanuel. And if you know what that name means for God, it means God with us. One of the most comforting names, one of the most comforting descriptions that we can have during this time that we are not alone, that we no longer are longing potentially, but that God is with us. That's a pretty cool concept, is it not? We see this in Matthew 1, 20 through 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And if you remember last week when we looked at John chapter one, and if you missed last week and haven't listened yet, I encourage you to because I think it is a baseline of so many things in this world. We read this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And in one of my most uh, favorite summarized verses as Eugene Peterson's uh, The Message, he translated this verse as this, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Jesus as your neighbor, good news or bad news? Some of you are like, I hope the sermon ends now. So what is it that we under, understand? Let's continue. As you know, most countries, not all countries and not all people groups, but a lot of the countries separate time by when Jesus arrived, right? B.C., A.D. Now, this isn't straight across the board because there's different mindsets or thoughts or even religious uh, viewpoints. And not all of this is religious, but in a lot of cases, in most cases in our world, time has been separated by when Jesus came. This kind of indicates something significant about this event that took place. Now, a lot of times in our lives, we have these markers where we're like, this is who I was then. This is who I am now, right? This is who I was when I had this job, or this is who I was as a teenager, and then I got married, or whatever it was. We have these markers. I often refer to them as younger Dale would have done this. And it's usually not super mature. I'm going to get there one day, I promise you. No, I don't. That would be a lie. My goal is to never be mature. So, but that being said, there's markers in our life. I remember when my daughter was leaving for college and she's like, mom and dad, are you guys going to be okay home alone? <laughs> I'm like, we were married 10 years before you got here, girl. We'll be just fine. And we weren't fine. <laughs> So I flew her home this weekend just to go to a football game with me this afternoon because what better way to spend an afternoon with your daughter than watching Nick Bosa hit Tom Brady over and over and over. I'm just kidding. He better, huh? I mean, gently, you know, like lift him up and, and put him down. But we have these markers in our lives, in our own lives, right? This is who I was, or this is when I was. And we may have even a marker of like when you came to know Jesus. These are these points in our lives. But the event of all time that marked it was this one, was Jesus. 
there seems to be something significant there because as followers of Jesus, this probably should be some significant marker for us. For he is the center potentially of everything that we do. He might be the center of our purpose. He's what we hope for, what we understand about ourselves, what we understand about church, how we see God the Father, and what to do with this created fire within us. And from this response, there's a few ways of looking at this. You see, one thing that most people in this world would agree upon is at least you can admire him. You can admire Jesus. You would join the massive amounts of people who admire him at some level. Because most conversations that you have with people is that he was a good guy. I've had a few with people who try to claim he never existed. That's an interesting conversation to have. But at a baseline, you admire him. And maybe that's where you're at even today. Like, I, I admire him. But there seems to be a little bit more than that. Because it's far easier to admire someone than to imitate them. When Jesus wants from all of us is not just our admiration, but maybe our imitation. Man, that's hard, right? Come on, who's really good at imitating Jesus? Because when our lives get tough, just admiring him doesn't really help. If you're having a real struggle of communication within your marriage and you admire some of these other couples you've heard about, that doesn't really meet the need of good communication. You might be in a, in, a, in a disagreement with your spouse and you look at somebody else and you're like, good for them. Admiration doesn't really help. When you're in a bind at work, I mean, it's tough and it's hard to get, keep going or something has happened and you're just in this deep struggle. Just admiring a list of people who had great worth, ec worth ec ethic before you kind of falls short. And simply to say, well, I'm gonna mimic what they did. Maybe it falls short. See, imitation does seem more important than just admiration. But then we get this phrase from Paul, and I'm gonna throw something at you today, and I'm just gonna say, what do you think? We hear this from Paul. Now, you are the body of Christ and each of you are a part of it. Let me read that again. You, now you are the body of Christ and each of you is a part of it. You see, imitation is important, but there seems like we need to go even beyond just imitating Jesus. He is more than a model to be replicated. What Jesus wants is not admiration, not simple imitation, but this. Jesus wants us, but what Jesus wants of us is that we undergo a transformation with his presence so as to enter a community of life and celebration with him. You're like, oh, that's it, huh? Let me read it again. What Jesus wants is that we undergo. There's something transformational that happens. It's not just an act of human will, like, oh, I admire Jesus, he's cool. Or just imitate, like asking ourselves, what would Jesus do? Just try to do that. But what Jesus is actually asking us to do is that we undergo a transformation with his presence so as to enter into a community of life and celebration with him. You see, Jesus is not a law to be obeyed, or a model to be imitated, but a presence to be seized and acted on. Let me try to explain it this way. Here is the common, but also under understood story of the incarnation. Now, some of you are like, Dale, you talked about this last week and like, a month ago and like three months ago and six months ago. Here we go again. In the beginning, you're like, how long is this sermon? I'll be brief. In the beginning, God created the world, right? And everything in it. And last week we saw that 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same as the beginning with God. All things were created by Him, and without Him, nothing was made. So in the beginning, Jesus and God, His Father, created, concluding with the masterpiece of His creation was humanity. But humanity soon sinned and became helpless to save itself. But God in His goodness and His mercy decided to save humanity. So God prepared and started to call individuals and entire people groups and then prophets who all spoke to people through them, slowly preparing salvation. Finally, when the time was right, God sent a son some couple thousand years ago to be born in Palestine. The amazing part that we see is that it wasn't just God was not just human, but fully human and fully divine. He walked on earth for 33 years. He revealed about God's nature. He taught great truth. He healed people. He worked miracles, but eventually was falsely accused, arrested, crucified, and he died. They did not know what to do with a human who could do what God only could do. So they killed him. The beautiful thing is that he rose three days later and for the next 40 days made various appearances to his followers. And at the end of his time with his fathers, now more adjusted to this new reality of resurrection, he took them to a hillside outside of Jerusalem and he blessed them. And then he ascended gradually and physically to heaven. Now, you may think, what is wrong with that? Is this a test, Dale? Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, especially you, Sean, don't raise your hand at this moment, okay? It's not that it's misunderstood or wrong, it's under understood because what this scenario does, this concept is that God walked on this earth physically for 33 years and then he returns to heaven. The Holy Spirit comes, which is an amazing, empowering, yet physically absent presence of God, maybe. Once again, what's wrong with this? It's right in its own world to say, man, it dealt with our sin. It's part of God's mercy. It's God coming physically to earth. But here's what I want you to consider. Where it's under understood is that it gives the impression that the incarnation was a 33 year experiment, a one shot incursion by God into human history. In this version, God came to earth physically and then after 33 years went back home. It uses the past tense for the incarnation. Let's just breathe for a sec. How many of us are using the past tense for the incarnation? We're admiring, we're imitating the past tense. I never see a point in scripture where Jesus is like, reflect on the past tense. Behold, I am doing an old thing. It's not what he says. Here is a full understanding of reality. The incarnation is still going on and it's just as real and as radically physical as when Jesus of Nazareth in the flesh walked the dirt roads of Palestine. Some of you are like, our pastor has either lost his mind or I'm not sure what's happening. Are we looking for Jesus to walk through the doors at this moment? Sean, stop talking. I'm just kidding you right now. <laughs> Somebody's like, whoa, Dale's being mean to Sean. I hear you, brother. You want, you want the microphone today? Amen. Whoa. How many of you heard that? Talk to Sean afterwards. <laughs> Here's another reference about this from Paul. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. 
and he'll raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Here can be a bit of mind-bending truth, if you will. This idea that we are the body of Christ is not an exaggeration, nor is it a metaphor. To say that the body of believers is the body of Christ is not saying something that Scripture doesn't say. Scripture never says that the body of believers replace Christ's body, nor that it represents Christ's body, nor even that it it's a Christ mystical body. It simply says what? We are Christ's body. It talks about this corporately, that we together outside of this room, around the world, are the body of Christ. It also talks to us specifically when Paul's talking around sexual activity. He says, remember that you are the body of Christ. And how is that body of Christ living out. Here's the implication. The word did not just become flesh and dwelt among us. It became flesh and continues to dwell among us within the body of believers. This body of gospel-centered followers of Jesus. Is it possible that God is placed, that he still has a physical skin and can be physically seen Touch, smelled, heard, and tasted. When's the last time you thought that God could be physically touched, seen, smelled, heard, and tasted? We often think about this maybe reminds me of God or that God is separate and I am here. Because if it is true that we are the body of Christ, then God's presence in the world today depends very much upon who? Upon us. We have to keep God present in the world in the same way Jesus did. We have to become God's physical hands, his feet, his mouthpiece and heart into this world. But for some reason, we kind of implode on each other sometimes. Sometimes the most hurtful spaces are within what God and Paul is calling the body of Christ. Sometimes it's even in churches that we start to implode and say things and feel things and exert things upon each other. I was listening to a podcast a few weeks ago of somebody that I knew that kind of gets attacked online He's a very well-known person. He, he's out there and, and trying to do the best he can. And then he gets attacked online about who he's engaging with. He doesn't get attacked online from non-Christians. He gets attacked from other Christians who is attacking him about spending time with non-Christians and who he's with. So he described it like this. It's kind of like you're in a boxing match and you're out there and you're doing all the fighting that you can. You're like, wow, Pastor Dale, are you a boxer? Yeah, I am. So. He's fighting and you're out there. Then the bell rings. And at the time of the bell rings, you go and sit in the corner. And then your own trainer starts punching you at the same time. He goes, that would be ludicrous. He goes, that's what sometimes the body of Christ does. We're out there fighting. We're out there doing the best we can. We're trying to live out the gospel within our own lives. But then we turn on each other. And we challenge each other. And we fight with each other. And the world goes, that's the body? That's the body of Christ. Let me show you something, remind you of something. The very first series that we did when I came here in March, and it was Lent, we learnt, taught through this passage of scripture from Philippians. This scripture is really the incarnation. This scripture really is how Christ continues to live in us. Let me read it to you. Let's see if you can find it. Therefore, 
if you have any encouragement from being called, from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking at your own interests, but each of you in the interests of others in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God did not, recar- did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge for Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and troubling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Is it possible that the incarnation didn't end after 33 years? When we celebrate incarnation, is it possible that is a present tense reality within those who call Jesus their Lord and Savior? Is it a possibility that it should show up not as a heavy weight, but as an opportunity? When you say, God, where are you in this world? He says, where am I in you? Let's go. Let's be. I'm with you. In those places of darkness where you're like, I wish God would show up there. He's like, me too. (laughs) Let's go. There are some who sit and many who sit and cry and weep over our town and over our valley and over this area of this place of a godless society. And you're like, God have mercy. Come. He's like, I'm there. I'm in you. Let's go. You see, this time of year when we celebrate incarnation, Jesus is like, let's continue to because I'm still fully human, fully God. But now I'm in you and among you and with you. So here is the under understood issue that we fail to realize is that the incarnation continues in us. It's amazing. We don't strive to get his attention. We already have it. We don't strive to get like, God, what do you want me to do? We already have it. It's like, how about we just start doing it? Let me try and land this here. There's a difference between what I would reference as a theist and as an incarnate Jesus follower. You see, a theist believes in a God in heaven, someone who believes in God. An incarnate Jesus father believes in a God in heaven who is also physically present on this earth inside of human beings. The theist believes that God is transcendent and present only as some kind of vague being. But the incarnate Jesus follower is that God is also transcendent, they believe, and has a physical body on earth that can be seen and heard and felt and tasted and smelled. Are we theists alone? Are we incarnate Jesus followers? 
This may seem abstract, but its implications determine how we pray, how we look for healing, for reconciliation, for guidance, and how we understand living out the incarnate communities we come together. Here are some super tangible ways. See where you fit and where you long to be. If I'm with my mother and she becomes sick and I pray that she gets better, but do not drive her to see the doctor. Potentially, I've just prayed as a theist and not as an incarnate Jesus follower. If I see a friend who seems to be struggling with a depression or is in conflict of some kind or is in crisis of some kind, then I pray for her. But I do not engage with the intention to serve her in some way, to help carry her burden, to share the burden within her life, I've simply prayed as a theist, not as an incarnate Jesus follower. If I pray for a friend that comes to mind, like we talk about a lot, someone's come to your mind and you pray for them, but you don't let them know, hey, I'm praying for you. I just want you to feel blessed that God gave me your name and I'm praying for you. You send them a text, you call them. How, how can I bless you today? If you don't do that, it's quite possible. You're just praying as a theist and not as an incarnate Jesus follower. And if I pray for peace in this world, in this valley and in this town, but do not inside of myself, forgive those who have hurt me or pursue reconciliation with those I have hurt. It's quite possible I'm just kind of praying as a theist and not as an incarnate Jesus follower. The most beautiful thing about Jesus coming to earth is that God came near and he remains near and how it shows up in his followers is that we come near and stay near and journey just as he would have. Because as we talked about last week, the fiery energy of God that so burns inside of us, it will come to maturity, creativity, and calm when we shape our lives and our bodies in the way that Jesus shaped his. When we do our part in carrying the incarnation forward. What a beautiful phrase, even this Christmas time. How can I carry the incarnation forward? How can I show up with for people? How can I be who Jesus was and is? So the one from the beginning who created the fire within us comes in the form that he created human to address the broken holy longing within us and to bring shalom back into the world as it was in the garden. My friends, this is Christmas. Let's take a few moments and just Listen to what God may be saying to you. If nothing else, it's a few moments of just taking this in. For some, you might be like, I've heard this before. Great. My challenge or my encouragement as your pastor is, is an infusing in you. Take a few moments and let God speak to you. He speaks words of kindness and love, affirmation. Sure, there's challenge in there. Maybe ask him, God, where 
Where do you want to go? Where, where shall we go? Who needs the physical touch? The smells, the hug, the words of the incarnate Jesus. Maybe you've come today and you're like, I've never ever asked or even know how to have this within me. As I shared in the overview, God created humanity and it was good. That's where the gospel always has to start. It always has to start with God created and it was good. Then the fire got misdirected and we sinned. And Jesus came back in human form and fully God, fully human to be us, to be reconciled back to his father through his death, through his resurrection. moments, Jesus says to people like, repent or just turn, just turn from your old way of thinking and let me in. It's as simple as that to start, to say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I let go of the sin and I let you in. Forgive me. ask God in the final moments, how can we continue the incarnation of Jesus in the world around us? Speak to us, God. Father, we thank you. In your name, amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Man, I, what a I just think for us to ask ourselves, how does the incarnation continue through me this week? Might be a moving, empowering, focusing thing to be and to do well together as we go into this week. And let's see what God can do. God bless you. Have a great, great day. Oh, bit our sad division.